Rain, which we had some, they'll push on up. Yeah, and we had a, uh, this every year up there, you know, we have the, them come up to treat a few of them. Yeah. And uh, they don't come up until, because right now the creek is real low. Uh -huh. So they have to have quite a bit of rain before they come up. Yeah. Usually it is until October, November. Well, if they're smart enough to go, they don't want to get caught in, 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 in the puddle. Yeah. 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 of Christ followers, Lord. We'd like to ask your blessing upon this service and, the, and all the people attending today. We ask you to bless those that can't be here for any particular reason, Lord. At this time, we'd like to thank you for your word, our Bible, Lord, for the truths and the guidance we can find in there to get us through our lives in a manner that would please you, Lord. And we pray for Christian churches throughout this world, Lord. We pray for a revival and your Christian churches would be filled, Lord. And we're thankful for the country that gives us the freedom to uh, worship in a manner that, that pleases us. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm. You may be seated. Uh, we're still struggling with technology here, but we'll get there eventually. We, we, we don't have the overhead today, but that's okay. We're going to keep on singing. We're going to be in the Red Book this morning, number 197. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, number 197.
starting every day with that thought this is the day the Lord has made no matter how it turns out this is the day the Lord has made we should live in it rejoice and be glad in it king of kings lord of lords we sang this on our revival haven't sang it in a while so I was looking forward to leading this today let's go through it about three times seconds. <laughs> Good thing I had it memorized, but he is our great master. He is the Lord of everything, and his name is wonderful. We'll be taking up the communion now, and I'll be doing the communion message this morning. 
I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in the first. Chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under a cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat the same spiritual meat, and all did drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus Christ. You know, I know our grandkids have asked me, they asked the first time we had communion, they were here, they said, oh, what's this all about? I said, well, we told them, you know, this, this is for people who get baptized, this is one of the ways we worship Jesus, but I'll talk to you more about it later. Well, I talked to them about it later, explained that Jesus died for our sins, he set up this last supper right before he died, and he asked us to do this and remember it. So I explained this to them. Of course, the next question is, well, what's baptism? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a little more tricky question. <laughs> what's baptism? Baptism is becoming part of the family of God. Baptism is making a commitment to worship God. Baptism is making a commitment to be here. Baptism is making the choice to choose God over ourselves. But Jesus set up this, that we could remember him. As it said here, they all drank from that same spiritual drink, and they all ate from that same spiritual meat. And once we're baptized into the family of God, we come together every Sunday, and we eat the same spiritual food, we drink the same spiritual drink. We do that as we hear messages, sing songs, and we also do that as we take this Holy Communion. We take the loaf, our spiritual food, that represents our spiritual food, take that in. We take the drink, that represents Jesus' body. He was that rock that provided us that spiritual drink, as Paul says in Corinthians. So we need to think on these things because Jesus asked us to remember him to have a word of prayer before we partake. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you did send your son down to die for us, that we could have this spiritual drink and this spiritual food, that we could always take it in, not only in listening to hearing the lessons, but in taking this communion. Pray that you'll bless our taking of this communion, help our hearts to be in a right place. Bless the loaf that represents Jesus' body, Bless the cup that represents Jesus' blood. Help us to always take it in a right manner and help us to always share your son with others. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, after he prayed, took the loaf and broke it, passed it around, said, every one of you eat of this. There's my body. In like manner, he blessed the cup, passed that around to everyone, said, drink ye all of this. 
New Testament in my blood. For the uh, tithing meditation, I'll be reading Luke 21, 1 through 4. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has been put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of, out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Do you, know, do you know the joy of selfless giving and love for others? True love does not calculate. It spans lavishly. Jesus drove this point home to his disciples while sitting in the temple and observing people offering their tithes. Jesus praised a poor widow who gave the smallest of coins in contrast with the rich who gave greater sums. How can someone in poverty give more than, some, than someone who has ample means? Jesus' answer is very simple. Love is more precious than gold or wealth. Jesus taught that real giving must come from the heart. A gift that is given with a, with a grudge or for display loses its value. But a gift given out of love with a spirit of generosity and sacrifice is precious. The amount of, or size of the gift doesn't matter as much as, it, as the cost to the giver. The poor widow could have kept one of her coins, but instead she recklessly gave away all she had. She praised someone who gave barely a Jesus praised someone who gave barely a penny. penny. How insignif insignificant of a sum, because it was everything she had, her whole living. What we have to offer may look very small and not worth much, but if we pull all we have at the Lord's disposal, no matter how insignificant it may seem, then God can do with it and with us what is beyond our reckoning. Do you give out of love and gratitude for what God has already given to you? That's the question. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we are truly thankful for all that you provide for us, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you'll create each one of us a giving heart so that we give back a portion of what you've given to us back to you so that we can help further your kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And for, let's see, we're doing announcements now, right? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, any praises? I can see a praise right back there. Bob James is sitting back there, so that's a praise. <laughs> Uh, any other praises so far this week? Yes. Sure, Mikey. Well, I see Sherry back. Well, yes, Sherry is here. Yes, and that is the time. Yes. We'll have to continue to pray for Sherry. Any other praises? Bob? I want to thank all the people in the church for their prayers. And uh, I thank God for answering those prayers. We do too. Also, I want to thank a great, great man. Yeah, we won't mention that guy's name. He doesn't really like to be recognized. But we all know who it was. <laughs> Prudence, did you have something? I was just going to say it's nice that Sam and his wife are back. That is true. It's nice to have Sam and Lorena here. Okay, so uh, any new prayer requests that aren't on the list? Wilma? Lois? Yes. Lola? Be in prayer for Marcy Smith for the loss of her son Jason. Okay. Sam? Uh, Mary Franson from the Bannon Church is in the hospital with an infection. Oh. Mary Franson from the Bannon Church is in the hospital with an infection. Okay. Any others? Everybody more, we're going to be going on a trip here. And I'm just 
special prayer for Jan and Tom. Tom and Jan are going to be traveling? Wednesday. Wednesday? Okay. Dick? Uh, so tentatively scheduled in October your surgery. Okay. Okay. Derek? Yeah, we're going to pray for uh, Johanna and, and Ezekiel and whoever's coming with them that they have a safe flight back to Oregon. Anybody else? No? Okay, uh, we'll go down the list here. Uh, Sherry still needs prayer. Uh, Lois uh, mentioned a, a lady named Shirley's having back surgery. Uh, need to continue to pray for Charmay who has cancer. Uh, Mac McPherson's got health issues. Um, we need to remember Jerry needs lots of prayers for medical conditions and whatever anything else is going on. Uh, we need to remember to keep Steve, who's uh, traveling in Alaska, for in our prayers. And uh, Lawrence is trying to sell his house now, so we need to keep that in our prayers as well. Uh, let's see, Sandy's in hospice, hospice care, and Doc Slider is not doing well, and all these other people that are traveling. Uh, let's see here, uh, September birthday, birthdays, there's a lot of them. Leslie's on the 5th, Chris is on, Christopher's on the 6th, Langston's on the 9th, and Midori's on the 10th. Um, none of them are here, but uh, are we going to sing them happy birthday? Yeah, we are. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Uh, ladies quilting is every Wednesday at 10. It's inspirations, the last Sunday of every month. Sunday school for the kids is at 9.45. Uh, men's breakfast last Saturday of, the month, of every month, 9 a.m. at Dishner's. Uh, ladies' choir, are they practicing today? Not today. No, no ladies' choir practice today. Uh, contemporary choir practices Wednesdays at 6. And the first Sunday of every month is a potluck after morning church, and that is today. <laughs> Anything else? Any other announcements? Uh, John, could you say a prayer for us, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we share of gathering together in this place this morning. We have many needs and many problems. We pray that you'd be cognizant of all these issues. Thank you for the day that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, special music. Special music. I have. You have? What you like? Okay. I don't know. It doesn't look in the chart. Oh. <laughs> 338. Okay. So for special music today, we're going to sing congregationally number 338. Know who I have believed.
I don't know. <laughs> if nothing else, we'll leave it up to Gary tonight. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We are in the book of Ruth this morning. Ruth chapter 3. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word and thank you for how it instructs us and teaches us all the things that we need for this life and we pray, Lord, as uh, we continue our study in Ruth, that you will speak to us the truths that we need to hear, help us to grow and learn from them, and apply them to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Ruth chapter 3. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find you a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked as a relative of ours, tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached gently and quiet, quietly uh, and uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the cor corner of your garment over me, since you are the kinsman redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a kinsman redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning... If he wants to do his duty as your kinsman redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me the shawl that you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of, of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. And when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi, she asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. And added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Well, here's a woman of, of character, especially an outsider like Ruth, a Moabitess, how is she supposed to find a, a husband to support her and take care of her along with Naomi? Well, today she might run a personal, a personal ad in the Bethlehem Times. A widowed Moabitess female 
Suits hard-working man of character for long walks in the barley fields and quiet evenings by the fire. Must be willing to take in a mother-in-law. <laughs> but back then, you know, it, it was harder than it is today. But uh, one thing Naomi decides to do that this must be dealt with, you know, for not only Ruth's sake, but uh, for hers as well. So Naomi, she comes up with this plan for Ruth's life. Ruth needed a husband, and she was still young, and they both needed someone who could provide for them, um, give them a place to, to live, and, uh, and also help escape the, the poverty that they're in. But who in Bethlehem, you know, would uh, be willing to do that? Who, who, who would be willing to provide for an outsider like Ruth? Well, Naomi thinks that she knows the answer, Boaz. Boaz is a man of character. And we were shown in chapter 2, you know, that he was also a relative of Naomi's. And a man who has already shown that he's willing to count the cost. He's, he's uh, made provisions for not only the poor and needy uh, in his fields, but he has especially gone out of his way um, to help Ruth and Naomi. Well, how would you go about uh, trying to set up Ruth, uh, Ruth and Boaz? How could Naomi get them together? What would be the best way of going about it? Well, uh, Naomi, she devises a plan. So the night when the, when the winnowing is over, Boaz would be sleeping out in the grain. So you see, during the harvest time, the, the men of the village, they would take turns using the threshing floor. And it was usually a raised platform outside of the village. It was usually on a hill where it could catch the, the evening breeze. And Boaz, he would put the sheaves on the floor and then separate the, the grain from the stalks, either by having oxen walk on them or by beating the stalks himself. And then once the grain was separated, then he would throw the grain into the air and the, the breeze would carry away the chaff and the grain would fall to the floor. The grain would then be piled up and carried away to sell or to be put in storage. And they would work late into the evening and uh, they would sleep on the threshing floor, uh, partly to protect the harvest, you know, from thieves and whatnot. And so Naomi, realizing that Boaz was going to be outside of the village and using the, the threshing floor that evening, she sees this opportunity. So she says to Ruth, get washed, get dressed, make yourself presentable. Tonight is the night. Go and see where Boaz lies down and then lie down next to him at his feet. Now, this is a little risky. Because, you know, she's putting her reputation on the line here, along with her personal safety. Um, remember we had studied in the last chapter that it was, it was risky for four women to go and glean in the field. So it was risky for them to go out in the daytime um, and glean in the fields. How safe is it going to be for her to be wandering around at night? And also there's a chance she could risk her reputation, you know, by being alone with a man in the middle of the night. So Ruth, she agrees to her mother-in-law's plan, and so there she is alone with uh, Boaz on the threshing floor. Boaz had uh, finished his work for the day, he had eaten his dinner, drank some wine, and he, he goes and he lies down at the, the end of the grain pile, and he goes to sleep. And in the middle of the night, something disturbs him. And he rolls over, and whoa, there's a woman there. <laughs> now, the English translation, it's a, it's a little too subtle here. It says, in the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned to discover that a woman was lying at his feet. As if some, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time, you know, when you're sleeping out on the grain pile, like some cat disturbing you in the middle of the night or something, you know. No, it... <laughs> The Hebrew is much more shocking. It's more like he says, Whoa, what happened here? Who are you? 
And she responds, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Spread the corner of your cloak over me since you are a kinsman redeemer. Now when Ruth says, uh, spread your cloak over me or your garment over me, um, a couple of thoughts might come to mind here. Uh, first of all, Ruth is not asking Boaz to sleep with her. Uh, fornication was, was wrong in the Old Testament, it's wrong in the New Testament, it's wrong today, and Ruth, as we've seen and as we've read, it says that she was a woman of noble character. And uh, Boaz also said that she was a woman who took refuge under the wings of, of God. So she was a woman who had committed herself uh, with all that she had, you know, to, to do the right thing and to take care of her mother-in-law. So she's not a loose woman. That's not what's going on here. Or perhaps you might think it sounds like she's saying, I'm cold. Can I use part of your cloak to, to cover me? You know, like when your wife takes all the blankets. <laughs> but that's not what's happening here either. Um, because in the ancient world, you know, when a woman made herself available uh, to a man for marriage, she would say, you know, if you want to put your cloak on me, I'm cool with that. <laughs> and so when a, when a man wanted to ask a woman to marry him, he would put his cloak on her. So it's kind of a beautiful picture saying, you know, I want to come and I want to, I want to cover and protect you and care for you and provide for you. That was kind of the, the message. And so here she's lying at his feet. She's not beside him, she's at his feet. And he wakes up startled and she says, if you would like, go ahead and put your cover on me because I'm available. So she's saying, I would, I would like to be the one with whom you form this covenant. I, I would like to be the one that you betrothed yourself to in faithfulness. And then look at how uh, she, she ends here. Since you are a kinsman redeemer. So she reminds him of the fact that he is in the clan and he is free to redeem and to rescue uh, her and Naomi if he's willing. And I'll summarize Boaz's response here. Something along the lines of, all right. <laughs> Something along those lines. Uh, this this word for for garment or cloak is also translated wrong, and and that brings us back to chapter two, because in chapter two, verse twelve, Boaz says to Ruth, "May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge." So it's that same kind of idea, you know, even though though Boaz was admiring Ruth for taking refuge under God's wings, Boaz also, he's being used by God to be those wings, you know, to care for Ruth and Naomi. He gave Ruth free access to his fields. He gave her, remember, protection from the, the young men he gave her water from the well, and, and Ruth had said, Why have I found favor from you, Boaz? And Boaz says, Because you have taken refuge under the wings of God. And what Boaz is ultimately saying is, Because you've taken refuge under the wings of God, you're the kind of woman that I would like to take under my wings. Uh, it, it wasn't easy for an older man to say he's falling in love with this younger woman. And when she comes to him that, that night, he says, God bless you that you didn't go after a younger man. He was probably, you know, 20 years older than she is, and he, he's falling in love with her. And um, it isn't easy for him to tell her because he's probably thinking, you know, she's probably in love with one of those young, handsome men around here, you know. Who am I, you know? But Boaz, he showed her that he would like to be her protector and provider by showing her loving kindness, 
and by saying, I admire you for, for giving up everything to come here and to take care of Naomi and how you've come under the wings of, of the Lord God for your protection. So he's, he's delicate and subtle, but he's letting her know, you know, that he, that he does care about her. Um, and so she will come to him at the threshing floor and say, yes, um, but she will say it with an accent. This action, you know, so she crawls under his wing and she waits, you know, whether he's interpreted or she's interpreted him correctly or not. Because sometimes, you know, you can try to uh, interpret what the other sex is thinking or doing, and sometimes you don't always get it right. <laughs> but uh, so uh, she says, put, put your wing over me, you know. And uh, so there must have been kind of this, this silence while Boaz is kind of processing all this and taking it all in. I mean, you can just imagine the picture, right? The stars are out, they're outside, maybe there's a big moon. We had a big moon a couple days ago. Did you guys see that? Um, you know, it's midnight, everybody's asleep, and they're out in the village, you know, upon this hill on this threshing floor, and... And Boaz loves Ruth, and Ruth is falling in love with Boaz, and she's under his cloak at his feet, and he says, The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You've not run after the younger men, which, uh, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, he says, Don't be afraid, for I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. So again, he brings up her... Her character that's known that she is a woman of noble character and then comes this this incredible statement he says uh, Ruth according to the custom you know there's this man that has first dibs on you I, I can't proceed you know until everything is settled this guy first so he says stay at my feet until morning and I'll see what what I can do uh, but the stars are out, you know, shining, you know, it's midnight, they, they love each other, um, they're all alone, she's under his cloak, and so, but they're both acting in purity, you know, until everything is resolved, and this other man, uh, you know, is out of the way, and they can be united in marriage. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's neat to see, you know, that she's doing this, and she's she's come under the you know, she, she was a Moabitess, but she's learned the ways of, of being a Jew, and, and she was married to her husband, who was a Jew first, and now she's learning from Naomi, and she's living in, in Bethlehem and learning things. But, you know, today's mindset is, you know, if it feels good, do it. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. People don't want to be preached at. They don't want to be made felt guilty. But God says, you know, if you're in a situation like that where you're alone at midnight and the stars are out and you're you're in a private place that could be compromising, stop, you know, and then for the sake of God, for the sake of righteousness, and let the sun come up on your purity and and uh, do everything the way that the Lord has designed uh, for you to do it. So. God has called us to purity, and we, we need to be set apart. That's what holiness means. It means to be set apart from the world. So we ought to be like Boaz, and we ought to be like Ruth. They were deeply in love with each other, yet they had self-control to wait and, and to do it God's way. And um, if you today have compromised in those ways, you know, God can forgive you. God is willing and able to forgive you. And he can give you strength to be pure from this point on for the rest of your life. God will always be there to strengthen us and help us to become new and made new again. So, But, uh, but Ruth wants Boaz to marry her and to provide for her, you know, with security and safety and to, to be her kinsman redeemer. Now, we talked last time, you know, about the whole concept of the the kinsman redeemer 
It was a relative, you know, who would step in and buy you back, you know, if you were sold into slavery or, you know, if the circumstances were overwhelming, overwhelming you were going in debt. But, you know, and if she, if she was a widow, then a brother would step in and marry her in order to provide her with children for her dead husband. But if there wasn't a brother, then, you know, it could be a close relative that could do the same thing. But in this situation, there was no obligation. So like with Boaz, there wasn't an obligation for him uh, because he wasn't a brother. He was a close relative, but he wasn't a brother. So he wasn't, um, you know, according to law, he didn't have a legal obligation to marry Ruth. Um, and if that were so, you know, Naomi when they had to come up with this big plan to try and get them together, she, Ruth could have just walked up to Boaz and said, you're it, let's go. <laughs> but, but Boaz, you know, he wasn't a brother to her dead husband. He wasn't obligated. Uh, but what Ruth is asking Boaz to do is just to, to act more according to the spirit of the law, you know. The spirit of this law being the kinsman redeemer to want to provide and help somebody, help a family member, and um, to rescue them in their situation. So Boaz agrees to her request. He, he's willing to to take the risk, and he's uh, he's willing to pay you know the show, the social and financial costs because um, there could have been you know some social situations too with Ruth being a Moabitess and whatnot, but he, he welcomes her into his family as well as taking uh, Naomi in as the mother-in-law and he compliments Ruth for, for choosing him instead of going after a younger man. You know, a, a younger man would have been a better prospect, humanly speaking, but Ruth knows that, that uh, Boaz can be counted on. You know, he's, he's shown himself to be faithful and someone that really uh, like we talked about last time, he, he showed loving kindness, that word has said, where he was pouring out his loving kindness towards her and Naomi. So he, she knows that he would be someone that would be responsible to take care of her and Naomi. And so, and, uh, so Boaz uh, sees Ruth's plan, and yet um, they need to act according to the, the covenant the covenant, you know, and uh, to be faithful. And he's witnessed how, you know, she, he, he's praised her for leaving her own people and coming alongside Naomi to be with her and to, to take care of her. And so now she's chosen him um, and uh, he wants to be the one to be responsible and to take care of her. So she, Ruth, everything we see about Ruth is that she's a woman of, like Boaz says, of noble character. You know, uh, we studied about Proverbs 31 a few months ago and um, speaks of a woman of character, a woman whose deeds uh, should be praised in the city gates. And I think Ruth is an example of that Proverbs 31 woman, and Boaz recognizes this, you know, and his actions over and over show that he does recognize that and appreciates her. Uh, but then this complication uh, arises, you know, because there's this problem, because even though Boaz is a close relative, there's another redeemer who's closer in the family line than he is. So by rights, this other redeemer, he has a better claim uh, than, uh, than he does. So and, you know, Ruth may have been thinking, you know, am I going to have to go through this whole thing again and go to the threshing floor? And, you know, because there's this other guy that's a closer redeemer. But um, she doesn't have to because Boaz says, no, I'm going to go take care of this for you. You know, I'm going to track him down and I'm going to ask him. Um, he's going to kind of be her mediator and see if he's willing to redeem her. And if he's willing to redeem her, then... It's out of his hands. He can't do anything about it. But if he's not willing, then Boaz swears that he will be the one to do it. So one way or another, Naomi and Ruth are going to be cared for. So in the morning, uh, Boaz, he sends Ruth away. 
but uh, not before giving her six measures of barley. Six measures of barley! <laughs> I know, I know, you're not excited again because you don't know what six measures of barley is. Well, six measures was probably about 50 pounds of barley. So he's putting this 50 pound thing on her back and uh, she, she's carrying it home. So she must have been a strong woman, right, to be able to do this. And so Ruth arrives back at home and Naomi asks her a question. And it's, it's, it's not the question that most of the English uh, versions have in your Bible. Most of the versions say something like, how did it go, my daughter? That's not what Naomi asks. Uh, in the Hebrew, she asks, she asks, who are you, my daughter? And that question has puzzled scholars and translators for centuries because they didn't know what to do with this. Like, why would she ask her who she was, you know? Uh, doesn't she know Ruth? Is she having temporary amnesia? What's going on here? And so, instead of translating it that way, they translated it, how did it go, you know? But I think, you know, it's kind of like in those, uh, those superhero movies and the comic books, you know, when, when your, your friend has been watching your moves closely and they, they witness something extraordinary and they say, who are you? Like, there's something about you. Are you really Clark Kent? <laughs> So I think that maybe Naomi's kind of responding to her like that because you have to see the scene here. She's stumbling in the door, 50 pounds of barley on her back, and Naomi's like, who are you? Because every day, you know, she's coming in with, she's just doing these miraculous things. Ever since Ruth has come along with Naomi, all these amazing things have been happening. Her life is totally being turned around. Remember, uh, we talked about how she was depressed and saying, my life is over and everything terrible is happening. And then with Ruth, though, all these amazing things keep happening. And so she's like, you're not who I thought I was, you know. So she sees Ruth in a different way. And I think she's really starting to appreciate Ruth in her life. Remember how she was not even grateful that Ruth was coming along with her. And now I think she's really seeing her as somebody that the Lord's put in her life that she can be just really grateful. Um, so the Lord is continuing to bless both of them. And, um, and all these amazing things start happening. But now I want to turn your attention kind of in, a, in another direction because... Um, there's one other place where the Bible talks about someone placing their cloak on a young woman. You know where it is? Someone placing their cloak on a young woman because he's in love with her. Well, it's found in Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, and the 8th verse. And, and in this story, God is the lover. And he is speaking to Israel. And God is betrothing himself to Israel in the same way that Boaz is betrothing himself to Ruth here. He is the one that has committed himself in marriage to Israel like Christ has betrothed himself to us, the church. He is our bridegroom. So let me just read it to you in Ezekiel 16, starting in verse 4. When you were born, no one cared about you. Your umbilical cord was left uncut, and you were never washed, rubbed with salt, or dressed in warm clothing. No one had the slightest interest in you. No one pitied you or cared for you. On the day that you were born, you were dumped into a field and left there to die, unwanted. But I came by and I saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there, I said, live. And I helped you to thrive like a plant in the field. You grew up and you became a beautiful jewel. Your breasts became full and your hair grew, though 
though you were still naked. And when I passed by and saw you again, you were old enough to be married. So I wrapped my cloak over you to cover your nakedness. And that's where it's the same wording there. He's placing his cloak over her. So I wrapped my cloak over you to cover your nakedness, and, then, and I declared my marriage vows. I made a covenant with you, says the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Then I bathed you and washed off your blood. I rubbed fragrant oils into your skin. I gave you expensive clothing of linen and silk, beautifully embroidered, and sandals made of fine leather. I gave you lovely jewelry, both bracelets and beautiful necklaces, a ring for your nose and earrings for your ears, and a lovely crown for your head. And so you were made beautiful with gold and silver. Your clothes were made of fine linen and were beautifully embroidered. You ate the finest foods, fine flour, honey, and olive oil, and became more beautiful than ever. You looked like a queen, and so you were. Your fame soon spread throughout the world on account of your beauty, because the splendor that I bestowed on you perfected your beauty, says the Sovereign Lord. So what a beautiful picture of, of God caring for and loving Israel, first as this helpless infant, and then as a beautiful young bride as he spreads his cloak over her and enters into this marriage covenant with Israel. And as I've stated earlier, you know, to spread your cloak over also speaks of, you know, being covered with wings because it emphasizes this idea of protection. And, you know, this was also the picture that Jesus used of Jerusalem and his, his plea over Jerusalem when he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not let me. So Israel needed this protection and this love of Jesus, and so does everyone. But not everyone will recognize their need for coming under his protective wings. Our great Redeemer, Jesus Christ, as you remember this whole story of Ruth is pointing to Jesus. He is the picture of what Boaz is in this story. He is our great Redeemer. He wants to protect us. He wants to cover us with his wings. In Hosea, the second chapter, the Lord uses this, this language as well, speaking of Israel as his wife. And he says, therefore, I will allure her and win her back once again. I will lead her out into the desert and speak tenderly to her. And there she, she will give herself to me and she will sing as in the days of her youth. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and I will make you my wife, forever showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you, and I will make you mine, and you will finally know me as Lord Yahweh. And you know, uh, we have that same love relationship with Jesus as Israel did in the Old Testament with Yahweh. Jesus said to us, I'm your bridegroom, and he called us, the church, his bride. And the New Testament says that the, the church is the bride of Christ, and because 2,000 years ago Jesus came to rescue us, he spent his life sharing us with loving kindness, and every single person that Jesus touched, he, he touched them with his loving kindness. And his ultimate act of loving kindness was to hang on a cross and to shed his blood so that anyone who comes and lays at his feet and says, cover me with your blood, Lord, spread your cloak over me, that person will be redeemed and made his bride. And he will pour out his unfailing love and his compassion on you. And he says, I will be faithful to you. I will make you mine. And you will finally know me as Lord. 
and I will come back to claim you as my bride. And there will be a wedding feast like you've never seen before. So my question to you this morning is, have you laid at his feet and have you asked him, Lord, spread your cloak over me. I want to be your bride. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message in Ruth and how powerful, how the scripture, there's just so many scriptures that are just overlaid in this passage and the, the kind of things that we see. We thank you that you are our great redeemer. We thank you for pouring out your loving kindness on us and wanting to be our bridegroom and also wanting to protect us and uh, to show us love and to, to provide for us all the things that we need. We thank you that um, you cared so much for us, that you didn't leave us as that baby out in the field just covered in blood, but you washed us and you took care of us and you nurtured us, and um, that's what you're always doing. You're continually watching out over us. You put your spirit inside of us to to guide us, to help us. You're with us every step of the way. And we thank you for such a great love that you've showed to us. Help us to remember that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Derek. That was just another wonderful message. Short book, the book of Ruth, but a lot of good stuff in there. Thank you for bringing that to us. We're going to sing our closing song from the Blue Book. Derek's requested we do number 249, Just As I Am. He also asked if I go ahead and read all, the, uh, lead all five verses. So, if you feel up to standing for all five verses, please do as we sing our closing song, number four, 249, Just As I Am. Just as I
Thanking you for the grace and the forgiveness you have for us. And Lord, we just pray that each day we'll look to you for strength and guidance. And Father, we want to pray for those that are not here this morning. We have a number that are missing and, and traveling and illness. Lord, we just pray you watch over them and have your hand on them and just watch over us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we are going to have potluck after this meeting, so we'll need to move some chairs and stuff. We need everybody to volunteer in the back. And let's sing Chorus of Family of God before we dismiss. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I was washed in the fountain, cleansed by.